Good morning, everybody. It's another episode of The Debrief, this time for the Chongqing Speed and Bouldering World Cup. It happened at uh, in the middle of, <laughs> of the night for everybody here in North America, which made it like really tough to be engaged. I know we talked about this uh, even just for the Moscow event for some of the times it can be tough to wake up. But man, like the, the 4.30 a.m. wake up call, that kicks you in the pants. I don't know how you dealt with this one. Uh, yeah, it, <clears throat> it was, uh, th this is tough. You better get used to it because we got another one coming up, uh, for the China thing, the China, uh, venue, but, uh, it's not my preference to, to have these, um, these ones that I think I watched this. <laughs> so full disclosure, I, I watched the semifinals, um, here. It was like late Saturday night, I think. Sure. Um, and then I went to sleep probably about. I don't know, midnight, one o'clock or something like that. And then I had my alarm set. I had the YouTube reminder set for the morning. Um, and and when I woke up, uh, somehow the competition it was had already clock or something. It, 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 <laughs> the competition had already happened. And which yeah. I we've talked about this before. I don't like to to do that. I want to watch it live because you never know when uh, things might get weird and the IFSC or or whoever might not posted or let it be posted on mm -hmm. YouTube, the replay. Um, so I ended up watching the replay probably just like a half hour, hour after it had finished on yeah. Uh, Sunday morning. Yeah. I, I, I think we'll, we'll, yeah, talk about that a bit more, especially just like how engaging these comps get, like really changes over the season and how the times go. But I know just off the bat, we just wanted to mention this and it's been made a big deal already by a lot of people, but um, uh, just our personal you know, thoughts in the climbing community, losing David Lama and Jess Ruskelly and Hans George Auer. Um, I'm not somebody that follows mountaineering at all. Uh, it's not something that really excites me, um, but it, uh, it really hurts uh, to like somebody that's like younger than us um, and who had finished his career in competitive climbing, like even before I had started climbing almost, right? Like he was in and out so fast. Um, but left like a huge mark and especially just seeing how the other athletes spoke about him and seeing some of those old pictures. Um, it was really, uh, yeah, it was a, a unique moment in the community. I don't know how you felt about it. Yeah. We're talking about David Lama here specifically. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, condolences to all, to all three of the families, but David Lama, um, you know, he was a, he was well known nowadays for his mountaineering, but um, there was a time about 10 years ago where he was a big name on the comp scene. Uh, and I think his his comp accomplishments have kind of um, not gotten as much attention oh, these past couple weeks uh, mm -hmm. or past couple days, you know, with the tragedy has not gotten as much attention as his outdoor stuff and his mountaineering. Um, for anybody that's watching this, the, the, I know on bouldering, the YouTube, the YouTube um uh, show or, or link on bouldering. They did a really nice kind of in memoriam piece ab about his comp, uh, specifically, which was really cool because I hadn't really seen much focus on the, on his comp stuff, David Lama's comp accomplishments and, and whatnot. Um, I have a soft spot for, for him because when I first started really covering the comp scene, it, it was, it was probably in like 2004, 13 2014 right around there which was kind of after david lama had had really i mean he was he had really kind of transitioned for the most part out of the comp scene at that point yeah. i think his big year was like 2008 yeah um and 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 so it's unfortunate that 2008 back then they weren't really live streaming the the competitions i, I don't even know if live streaming was really a thing um but even by 2013 2014 he, he was still a big name on mm -hmm. the comp circuit like you would you would just kind of hear his name referenced and whatnot um which i think speaks to just his you know how good he was um that, that people were still talking about him on the circuit even when he was no longer really on the circuit um yeah and if if you uh if for anybody that has heiko wilhelm's uh book beyond the face he's one of the athletes profiled in it and like the rest of them it's a great profile just kind of talking about, you know, the driving forces in his life and, and uh, how he feels about climbing and how he feels about success. It's only a couple pages, like all of them, but it's just a telling thing and it makes it really easy to relate to somebody uh, like that. And like you said, I was kind of disappointed how much of the like written articles uh, bringing 
bringing up his death, whether it was in like a mainstream um, news source or whether it was a climbing specific source, his competition climbing uh, competition accomplishments uh, weren't really noted very much compared to his his outdoor stuff, which is fine. And honestly, you can make an argument that his outdoor um, feats, especially his stuff on his own, is an athletic achievement far beyond his uh, his competition achievement, especially in a competitive field that was you know ten years less developed than it is now. Um, but I mean, talk about one of the original wonderkins mm-hmm. in competitive climbing. It's uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and you know, I was thinking, I w- it really, it really kind of walloped me when I heard this news. I mean, I, that, that goes without saying. I mean, it's a, it's a, it was a big tragedy. But I think another aspect that I kind of, that kind of hit me, was that, uh, you know, I haven't really thought about how to say it. But like the, so other sports, like if you look at, you know, baseball or football or basketball or soccer, whatever it is. I mean, there's so much. Like there's such a lineage of, um, I mean, there's decades and and mm-hmm. of 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 athletes that have kind of come and gone. Uh, we don't really have that yet with competition climbing, right? The IFSC itself is or is only, uh, you know, barely more than ten years old as yeah. an organization. Um, so we really haven't. I think we, meaning fans and the media, we haven't really had to process a lot of these. Um, no. instances of, <laughs> no. of of kind of people people passing away and yeah. and this was obviously very different this was a, a a tragedy because he was so young which is very different than like an older the older generation kind of passing away mm-hmm. um but it just kind of occurred to me that this is not something that we as comp fans um have really in you know i mean i know there have been cases in the past of of big name comp people passing away mm-hmm. but it's certainly um it's it's just it's just certainly still very it's so rare for our it's, sport because our sport's so young yeah and i it's kind of curious because you can imagine that more of those storied competitive climbers from the past will venture outdoors um and i mean hey even indoor climbing is dangerous um not to say it's more dangerous than any other sports but this might be a thing we have to cope with a little more often like you know before we get to the point where we're like retiring people's jerseys or numbers or things like that, you know, like when Killian Fishuber 30 years from now, when he's getting some ceremony at a world cup celebrating, you know, 40 years since his incredible run of wins or whatever, before that, we're probably going to deal with more issues like this. And it's, uh, it's too bad. So uh, just like a genuine thanks to, to uh, Charlie Bosco, who in the, in the finals of the bouldering world cup said something about it. I'm, and again, I don't think it's the responsibility of individual event organizers to to memorialize things like this, especially in a part of the world that maybe didn't have as much of a connection. But I really appreciate Charlie uh, saying a few words at the end of the bouldering final just to mention it on behalf of himself and all the climbers and the IFSC as well. So uh, it was nice of him to, to put that in there. Um, but yeah, let's... Uh, Let's go back to the World Cup. Anyway, it was it was one with actually a lot of stories. As much as I've kind of been complaining to you about how I felt really disconnected from this one because of the time, because of some like storylines that are are definitely recurring. And I know you've had some trouble yeah. for your creative ways uh, to to say that the same person has won a couple times. Um, but let's just run through the like the basics of it. If you didn't watch um, your first place, uh, well, we'll do bouldering first. Manuel Cornu comes away with his first ever gold medal in uh, in bouldering from. France. France, Tomorrow in Arasaki claims one of many second places. He's not new to earning medals. And in third place, uh, Angie Pehark from Slovenia, um, just part of the story of Slovenia being almost as equally strong as Japan. Um, but that's his first ever bouldering podium. Um, and then for the women, Yanya Garnbrett wins four in a row. Uh, Akia Noguchi in second. Again, no uh, no new face to podiums. And then Jessica Pills, who has a lot of success in lead climbing, especially this is her first bouldering podium. She walked away with the bronze um, very quickly. We'll do the speed one as well. Um, so I had a lot of fun watching speed this time. And of course, a new world record was broken. So for the women, first place was uh, Yi Ling Song. Second place was Alexandra Radzinska. And third place was Yulia Kaplina. And then first place, uh, Alfian Mohamed from Indonesia was first. Uh, Konstantin <clears throat> Pavlenko was second. And Sergey Rukin was third. So kind of a, a really young climber overtaking some uh, some 
slightly more well known. And I only say that because I have very little context for who's well known in speed <laughs> climbing. But uh, it, I really enjoyed his victory, Alfian's victory. Like his coach was psyched about it, and I really like. You know, it is cool seeing parts of the world that haven't been recognized in other disciplines of climbing at all. Like you're not going to see big Indonesian names in lead climbing or bouldering for the most part. So it's really cool to see that diversity across sports. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I had a really good time. How did, uh, how did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it a lot and we can kind of talk about it later when we, we give sort of our grades, uh, about the speed. I want to give props first and foremost to Charlie Bosco because he does a really good job and he did a really good job of um, explaining kind of who the big names were mm -hmm. and, and explaining when when there was somebody like Basa Mawim or somebody that kind of had an early out. Um, Charlie really contextualized it and said like, hey, that's a that's a favorite that's, mm -hmm. that's suddenly now out. Yeah. And I think that that that's really helpful. I mean, because if you and I, if people that that are really as deep into this stuff as you can be, if we kind of have trouble sometimes identifying like, well, who are the, like the big names and who are the new names and all this, like if that's, if we have to really concentrate to keep that stuff straight, then think about the new fan coming in. Well, right? I think like, like you and I are, are pretty representative of most climbers watching speed climbing. Like we are in our first couple steps of really paying attention to it. So you're totally right. He's doing like, and again, he did it solo this time. Whereas before he had, uh, he had help from, from Josh Levin, uh, like a pretty experienced speed athlete. So yeah, he did a great job. And I think you're completely right. The context of who is expected to win, who's less likely to win, that completely changes how you watch something. So that that was that's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, um, in, in terms of the, the comp on the whole, I'll just say that, yeah, as a person, as kind of a, a member of the media, and you're included in this as well, right? We have to talk about these events after they happen. And when I was heading into this event like like before the event even happened i kind of start to think about like well what are some of the storylines i need to watch for what are some of the potential storylines that i'll be able to draw from it when i'm writing a recap of, about the event and yeah i was thinking like well if yanya wins again that's going to be three in a row and so like in, in terms of writing the article about it writing the story yeah. about it like what do you it's like here we are again you know deja vu with yanya winning and and Luckily, though, with this competition, uh, where in which you know Yanya won, there were plenty of other storylines that kind of kept things interesting and kept things unique, and and there were, we come out of it with a lot of stuff to talk about, and it's interesting that we are in the midst of maybe one of, if not the best competition climber of all time, a, a once in a lifetime talent with Yanya. Um, and yet I would argue that maybe her winning was not the biggest story of the competition, sure. you know, so um, so that was exciting. Yeah, I think like I, I definitely understand that. I think there you, there can be kind of a, everything gets a little bit. I don't want to say success is boring, but if it becomes predictable, then what are you watching for, right? And it becomes less of a surprise. Um, and I think you you brought up a really good point that all of us need to do a much better job of is okay so we have somebody that we're all saying is like this might be the greatest competition climber of all time this might be the best female boulder of all time now we have to like actually start finding out if that's true right we have to start defining our metrics of what makes a great competition climber we have to and this is the fucking worst part is we have to start parsing through whatever IFSC data we can find in whatever ridiculous format it's in and start saying, okay, you know, what era of bouldering do we live in? Who are we supposed to compare Yanya to? Like straight up on the short term, should we compare her to Shauna Coxie, who kind of had a young breakout, um, although is slightly more current? Um, should we compare her to Akia Noguchi, whose longevity is like freaking ridiculous? Or should we go back further and take uh yanya as like a as a like three-dimensional athlete with speed and lead and start comparing her against like the all-time greats should we be going back into the early 2000s and the 90s and picking out those like legendary names that that are out there and saying okay how do we measure these people against so the hard part is it's not easy to find this information like i've started up this database myself of just going into every event page for every world cup pull out the top three names, type it somewhere else and just doing this over and over and over just so I can like f 
get some context for for these things. And an upcoming video will will hopefully come from some of that stuff. But it's like a ton of work just to find basic information, um, which is hard. But if we want to, like, there is so much unspoken stuff about Yanya right now. Like the the um, the debates we could be having about is she the greatest athlete of all time? When does that happen? What does it take yeah. to be the greatest? I think us as media, um, you as a writer, people in video, myself, whatever, like now's the time to start like digging into that stuff and make your argument. And I'd love to argue about that stuff. That'd be a great time. Yeah. Well, what do you think? I mean, if we just kind of put the like sort of the lightning round on both of us right here uh, <laughs> with the limited knowledge or, you know, the limited statistics that we have that you just pointed out. Is she is she the greatest? Uh, I I could not make a statistical argument because I don't know enough of the statistics. Like I've I've just last night after uh, after her win, I started going through and trying to keep track of okay who has won the most medals. But just in bouldering, doing three disciplines is way freaking harder than doing one. Um, but in my head, I look at somebody like a Kiyonaguchi and I say, I think of her as a greater all time boulderer right now. Um, I'm not even going to talk about all three disciplines. I'll just focus on bouldering. I would say that Yanya, you know, there might be an argument that this is one of the most incredible peaks of bouldering skill, especially considering that, you know, she, you know, basically wins a, a huge percentage of any comp that she shows up for. That's very cool. But there's already talk about her being frustrated with the level of boulders. How long is she going to actually stay in this sport, right? Like if she becomes the first Olympic medalist in climbing, does she stick around or is she going to like F off to the outdoors and try and do like the hardest outdoor climbs ever? She might not be around for that long. Like she could be retired from comp climbing before she's 24. I don't know what's going to happen. So longevity wise, I, I don't think she's old enough to make an argument for greatest of all time, but for maybe the greatest peak of performance, it's definitely in there. That said, I don't have the full context for, for all time. Right. I, I wasn't watching for a lot of it. So yeah. The, the, I think of the end of this Chongqing uh, live stream broadcast and Charlie, Charlie Bosco, if I remember correctly, he said, that it has been the highlight of his professional career to mm -hmm. be in attendance at every um, at every one of Yanya's World Cup competition victories. Yeah. Uh, that's high praise, you know? I mean, that sure. is... That's but I, in fairness, let's like, Charlie is also, and not that he's like new to this, but he's relatively new to this, right? Like I remember he, I don't know when he started doing these, but I was definitely at World Cups where he wasn't the commentator in 2015. He may have started in 2016. I'll, I'm hopefully going to interview him at some point, but you know, his, again, like it along the, he's making that comment. He's seen all of her wins, but she only started competing a couple of years ago. So as much as it is an incredible feat what she's done so far it is over a relatively short time span yeah i i think it's i'm i'm in agreement with you i mean we as much as we can bat this back and forth i think it's just too early it's it, she's too yanya is too young for us to be saying definitively she is the all-time great is she one of the all-time greats absolutely i think she's it, you'd be hard to argue that she's not at this point uh but i you know she's she's young um I'm more in, I, I think longevity counts for a lot uh, because we've seen a number of competitors have remarkable single or you know dual seasons uh, maybe not to the not in you know to the success that Yanya has has had mm -hmm. but nonetheless like we've seen people have these these few years of, of peaking and then they just kind of drop off um, whereas you have somebody like Akio who who is almost 30 she's i i was looking at her results before we started recording and she was like one of her best years was like 2014 you know where sure. she just had like multiple uh first place finishes in bouldering world cups and it's mm -hmm. like that's you know five years ago is that's a that's a huge span of time for yeah. competition her she is more likely than not to be on any podium for any bouldering event right like she she has just been a mainstay for so long so i'd be willing to cede that this is like the era of yanya um but if she stopped okay let's say yanya i'm not gonna i'm not gonna curse her let's say yeah. she decided to retire tomorrow for whatever reason um 
in a couple of years, would we still remember it? Like, let's say Yanya is out of this field and it's back to Akio and Miho and maybe Katja Kadich, who's been showing up, Shauna Coxie, Futaba. Like, the one thing that I do really like about this is we're getting this excellent contrast of we have one sex where there is dominance and like a, a genuine era. Like, this is Yanya's era. She. If she loses, that is a bigger story than her winning. And yeah. then on the men's side, even with superstars like Adam Andra, it is an incredibly dynamic field. Like we are, there's like a level of me that was shocked to see that Sean McCall, Jan Hoyer, and uh, Jakob Schubert made it into semifinals. And those are some of the biggest names in bouldering. But you get to this point where you're like, this field is insane. You don't know who's going to be in finals. You don't know who's going to win it. So you get this really cool comparison between the two. And it's giving us a chance right now to say, okay, you know, for all this shit we've talked about, like storylines and all that stuff, is there one that we prefer more than the other? Because there's certainly more of a clear story arc with somebody like Yanya in every finals, Akio in almost every finals, there's something going on there. Whereas in the in the other finals for the men, you're meeting new people every single time and it's harder to build storylines because, you know, what's the difference between being sixth place and 35th place? It's like one attempt to zone in qualifiers. So the storyline part is impossible for that. So I... I don't know. It's uh, it's it's really cool. Like it's a chance for us to actually think about what is more fun to cover and how do we cover these two really different situations. Yeah, and the interesting thing also is is think about. I mean, she's Slovenian, uh, which is a market that both you and I are not very familiar with, and certainly not very close to. We know they have uh, a ton of shoe executives. We know that Nike's <laughs> office there is is in hot pursuit of Yerne Kruder. Yeah. <laughs> Go back to episode two of our little uh, debriefs here if you don't know what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> but think about this. This this is kind of fun to think about. What if Yanya was, or what if there was a talent comparable to Yanya? What if she was Canadian or American? Think about what, how that would change our maybe perception of her if we got to see her um, in an, a context of Canadian media or American media. I think if 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 an American was being that dominant on the international scene, um, I mean, I think the popularity of competition climbing, assuming that, that, you know, the person played their cards right and whatnot in, in media, um, I just, it would be incredible. I mean, it would, it would be like, kind of like how Alex Honnold is here, but for a competition climber, um, which as a fan of competition climbing, I would love to see that. That would be incredible. I, I can't even really fathom it. Um, I think you're right. Like if you just look, if you take Ashima as a baseline, somebody who has most of her accomplishments are in the context of her age, right? Um, and she has incredible, like she's one of the top five, I would guess, sponsored athletes in the world. Um, like just in terms of income and the profile of, of uh, sponsorship she has. If for you, climbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, none of that is really competitive uh, none of that's really earned through competition for the most part, right? Um, yeah, if you put her, if you put Ashima at at this Yanya level, I think that would, uh, yeah, that would be in that would be nuts. Mm -hmm. You it's USA just, climbing would have so much money, man. You guys would be sending so many athletes to World Cups if you uh, if you had that kind of profile. That's a really good angle to take, actually. Um, now that said, I don't know what the European angle is over there. I don't know what the vibe is. I don't know if she's on the cover of every like you know, commuter newspaper and on the back of like a cereal box. I have no idea. But yeah, you're right. If she was American, she'd probably be on a Wheaties box right now. I'd love to hear. I know that we have some people that watch this over in Europe. I would love to hear how how Yanya is treated um, in terms. It's hard to say Europe or specifically Slovenia because I think they could be they could be quite different. Uh, but I would just be curious to hear how how her what her celebrity is like. I think um, she should just move to the states and change citizenship, and uh, and that be that, man. Yeah, just claim I, her for your team. <laughs> Done. This is where the money is. And, and you know, the, I mean, as much as we joke, though, that like we didn't even mention that I think the Americans and the Canadians, in their own right, did have pretty good, um, a lot of success here at Chongqing. Let's. Uh, um, what a good segue. Did, what a yeah, freaking good segue, I, John. That was awesome. Let's. Let me run yeah. through the Canadian stuff just so people uh, know what's up. Um, first of all, for the speed, uh, Sean McCall broke another personal best. Um, 
in context, it, it's actually just slightly slower than the new women's world record, which we'll talk about in a second. So Sean had a personal best. He's uh, ended up in 37th. Alana Yip had what looks like a rough day. She ended 53rd in comparison in Moscow. She was 33rd. So not maybe not exactly what they wanted, but, you know, I'm sure they'll uh, get over it. Um, and then in bouldering, it was actually uh, a really good round. So Alana ended up in eighth place after semifinals. Why can't I find my Canadian notes? Yeah, and uh, sh- so the nice thing about Alana was she did qualify, like barely qualified mm-hmm. in 20th, managed to knock it up to eighth place. And due to a really frustrating computer error, some people that weren't watching very closely might have thought she had a chance at, at being in uh, in finals. But it turns out the computer was just awarding tops where she absolutely did not top. Um, and then Sean actually made it into semifinals, which is great. Like his previous scores were 34 and 24 from the last two events. So finishing in 14th is a really big improvement. Um, that's going to matter a lot in qualifying for Toulouse if he doesn't uh, qualify for the Olympics through the World Cup. And then just to give a shout out, because this is the first event where Canada actually sent the entire team. Um, Paige Bocklischuk in 43rd, B. Evans in 45th. Both of them, that was their first World Cup. Uh, and they actually did uh, pretty well. Allison Vest in 63rd, who also shout out for sick live stream co-commentary. Yeah. Uh, and then Madison Fisher in 69th. Mm-hmm. And then on the men's side, Lucas Uchida, 41. Jay Hollowatch, 49. Nathan Smith, 55. And Zach Richardson, 69. Um, and looking through that, I was there's a lot of tops going deep down into the field. Uh, for men, at least, that was uh, that was pretty cool. I'm glad they got to uh, to actually get some success, even if they ended up very close to the bottom. But yeah, how how the USA make out? Well, and real fast before uh, you know, mentioning McCall, uh, Sean getting 14th place. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also interesting to note the context of that. So uh, Jong Won Chan of South Korea got 15th. Mm-hmm. So Sean did better than than Jong Won, and Jakob Schubert actually got 18th. <laughs> yeah, and those are both big names that. That would you would not be surprised um, to see them in the finals at any of these events. So Sean, I'm fourteenth is he's he's in really good company there, and I mean Sean is sure. in that group as well. You wouldn't be surprised to see Sean in any of these finals. Yeah. Um, it was it was an all around interesting one because like I said earlier, it was one of those events where going into semifinals there were actually some names that if you had paid attention five years ago you would recognize some of the names rather than yeah. just the Japanese athletes, right? Um, it was cool because I think uh, Jakob and Jan and Sean, for the most part, have been denied semifinals so far this year. So it was a particularly good event for a lot of the uh, the old schoolers. Yeah, I think I tweeted out at some point, I think it was maybe in the semifinals or something, that, that it was really cool. There was a, a, a sp- at one point, there was a like a camera shot where it was Jan Hoyer on one side and like Jain Kim on another side, and it was like <laughs> it was just this old school. I, I mean, you know, that, it's like this could easily be 2014, yeah, uh, but it's 2019. And oh, it's, the, and they, the, the you know, great one was Dave Barron's, like yeah. in a 30 freaking seven man. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's nuts. I think there was actually another UK climber a few years ago. I can't remember her name. Yeah, anyway, this I don't know her name, so I can't speak about it. But I, it seems like the UK does a does a good job of keeping climbers active into their like late thirties. Um, yeah. I wish I knew her. Anyway, uh, yeah, there was uh, there were some uh, some seniors that made it into semis too. But yeah. Yeah, and that just speaks to how I mean the fact that it was like Sean was fourteenth, Jong Won was fifteenth, Jakob was eighteenth. That just speaks to how uh, you know the the field is was so stacked, even down into you know I mean all. I mean, almost into like 20. It was like these huge names. Sure. So, so a lot of depth to it. Uh, in terms of the, the Americans, uh, let's see here. Um, Ashima did the best of, of the squad. There were, there were 10 Americans in total uh, in China. Ashima got ninth. Alex Johnson tied for 17th. Um, Margo Hayes got 19th. Kyra Condi 31st. And Sienna Kopp got 37th. So all five of those women were really like... And Sienna's really young, isn't she? Like that's that's a uh, like pretty good result for the like the bottom of your team's results. That's uh, that's pretty rad. Yeah. And I mean, to have all everybody on your squad in the top 40 um, sure. and, and three out of the five to be in the top 20. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think that's... I think there's a... That's... I mean, that's great. Yeah. Um, on the men, Nathaniel Coleman was 17th, uh, and then there were a lot of a lot of guys down the roster were tied. I think Sean Bailey was tied for 27th, which is interesting because that's pretty good. And he, I feel like he just we didn't really hear his name get mentioned on the on the live stream at all. Um, yeah. But he, 
but he was in yeah. like he was in pretty good company of like a lot of great climbers that were close yeah. but not close yeah. enough um zach gala was tied for 31st drew ruana was tied for 43 and john brosler was tied for 83 so um just kind of like spread out pretty much like all the way throughout the uh, the scores there um but you know ashima was ninth nathaniel was 17th alex johnson was 17th it's like i i said this in the recap that i was writing today it's just like i think it's a it's only a matter of time and this probably extends to canada canadians as well i feel like it's only a matter of time until we see a canadian or an american in in the finals you know because it's like they're pretty close if you're if you're ninth or you're 17th or you're Alani Yip, who's eighth, it's like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree. I think just in, like, I think the the Americans that I can imagine being in a finals, there's probably more of them than there are Canadians that I can imagine in a finals. There's probably, like, four Americans that I can imagine that, especially now that Alex Johnson can finish seventh and, like, be in semis again. She's on yeah. the list as well. Uh, for Canadians, it's, in, it's basically just Sean or Alana. Um, I would be... Uh, pleasantly surprised but i would be surprised if any other canadians made finals or even semi-finals frankly um yeah. but that's okay uh, yeah and we should mention that all these results are kind of i, I mean it's just the the temperature uh was a uh, charlie charlie Bo- <laughs> we keep referencing charlie bosco but uh we need to get him in here as like a as like a satellite reporter but he said on the broadcast <laughs> that uh that's a bit of a demotion was... at this point <laughs> i'm sure he <laughs> deserves a, something uh... more senior he said it was the hottest. Uh, it was the hottest event, World Cup event that he had that he had been in, um, that he had attended. I think I at one point they said it was like 93 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and, and I know that a lot of the Americans were saying on Instagram just how how hot and humid it was. Sure. Um, I think that really affected Kyra Condi. Uh, she got 31st, which is a little lower than than I think she's we, we would expect her to get. Um, and I think she, she mentioned that it was, you know, it was just due to the, the heat and the friction. I mean, that's 93 degrees is that's, that, yeah, like, I, I don't disagree. I just think the rest of your team did pretty well as well. Although she's from what Minnesota. So she's effectively Canadian when it comes to like how she copes with heat probably, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, like, I mean, imagine if you walked inside your gym and it was 93 degrees, you'd probably be like, mm, forget I'm this. Out. I'm going, I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, and yet. These, you know, these Shout out to all the uh, all the climbers there that have a membership at a gym that doesn't have air conditioning. You guys are the true heroes. I know there's way too many of you out there. You know, in Korea, a big thing in South Korea is they carry these like little pocket fans. Is that a thing in like all the like climbers at gyms? You just see them pull out these. Is little that fans. a thing in Canada? Is that what you were gonna say? That's <laughs> yeah. not a thing. That's not a thing <laughs> in Canada. No, 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 no. We well, don't. Like it's do pretty that. hot and humid in the summer in uh, in South Korea. Yeah. And um, sure, yeah, I can and, imagine number of those gyms aren't air conditioned but i just always thought that was interesting at the gyms people pull out these little pocket fans and if it works yeah absolutely we just complain and then cause brownouts from turning our air conditioning on too high that's how we deal with it in canada to balance out the the (laughs) really hot world cup event the ifsc should have an event somewhere that's like (laughs) oh yeah in the (laughs) arctic circle yeah man that'd be sick actually (laughs) yeah what what canadians actually like you're warming your hands rather than we're we're taking the world cup up to yellow knife northwest territories has there ever been a world cup in canada yeah uh so toronto had yeah had a run from 2013 to 2015 and previous to that on the other side of the country in canmore uh they had the 2011 world cup out there so yeah we've had a couple um typical story of countries trying to run world cups they don't make money uh they're very hard to do uh you got to be you know yeah you got to have backing somehow and it's really hard to make work so but yeah um i want to just quickly on speed uh going back to that i i actually had a really good time watching the speed this time there's a lot of stuff going on uh so first of all shout out to yiling song young chinese athlete who came first place but also broke the women's speed record twice uh the previous record was 7.32 um set in combination at different events uh by anna jobert of france and yulia um Kaplina, see, it it's all mm, this is we're we're professionals everybody yeah, remember that Yulia Kaplina um yeah. yeah she it was 7.32 shared joint Okay sure uh Two. and so uh in uh, in quarterfinals uh Yiling Song put up a time of 7.101 one. 
Yep. Yeah, and then she just uh, uh, in semifinals she put up a seven point one one, so a little bit slower, but she effectively broke the standing record twice, uh, which was rad. Actually, I think I've got video of this right now. I'm just gonna. Sound this was the, the replay. So yeah, Yiling Song on the left. Um, I think it's Natalia uh, Kudelka on the right. It was um, who did she? Uh, Kaluchka. Kaluchka, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I love she actually does a little bit of celebration and then her coach goes freaking nuts, yeah. which you can imagine. And something to point out that uh, just in this era of like Olympic money, right, is uh, is that now you've got um, China hired two Spanish speed climbers for their team. Um, we've already seen this in other countries, but uh, so if anybody's wondering what's going on with the, the two white guys, um, yeah, you're starting to see these um these coaches just like starting to cross country lines to whoever wants to pay for them and so they had a lot of fun too um so that was incredibly impressive on the men's side uh i loved having the chance to see uh she's in zhang uh climb against reza alipur that was probably the best like head-to-head race um that was awesome otherwise the story from speed finals for me aside from alfian winning is I'm just getting really bummed out with falls in speed climbing. It like instantly ruins the race. And I think it's probably about what, maybe a quarter of every race has a fall in it. Sometimes they fall and get back on and like put up a time so it doesn't say fall in the results. Mm-hmm. But it just like in a in a race that's 5 seconds or 6 seconds or 7 seconds, it sucks, man. I don't know what to do about it. I honestly like I don't know. Um, might be something to think about whenever they design the next speed wall, but it's it is a an annoying reality of speed climbing is falls because it's not it like right away it kind of invalidates the success of the other guy. It makes these amazing high level athletes look like scrubs when they just fall off the wall. Although I understand it's hard, I'm not like calling them, you know, complete chuds or whatever. But it it it's a bummer. I don't know. It sucks. I don't know if that ruined it for you as well. And again, this is probably like a problem that speed climbers and speed aficionados have been suffering forever. And I'm like, why is this problem? So anyway, it's probably been a big deal for a while. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, unique aspect to to climbing because in any other competition where you're measuring speed, whether it's uh, swimming or running or anything, it's like like actually stumbling off course like that is, is <laughs> well in uh, in uh, in hurdles in swimming, like it but... happens in hurdles i guess and sometimes it would happen in running and cycling and speed skating but one yeah, but... i think one big difference is for the most part you don't only have two athletes in that so one guy goes down and you've still got seven other runners like tearing it up so i don't know i think that's if it's anybody wants enough. if anybody wants to build an eight lane speed wall then we can have like full on sprinting style heats well, and you know what's interesting is you think about those other sports like running and uh, like hurdles or um, or cycling where there are f- falls or tumbling mm-hmm. off course essentially, but it's it's much rarer of course than it is in climbing. But you you do have instances where like if a if a cyclist falls, he takes out usually like whoever is <laughs> near him. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Speed, like, that's oh, like, that's what we need in speed. I wonder when when is that going to happen that there's a a climber that just has a a wild swing off the wall for speed climbing and actually like disrupts the 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 other climber. It's I mean it's unlikely. I, let's, I can't let's imagine just, it's we can just never change gonna... the homologated wall so that everything comes a little bit closer together and just have them so they're basically side by side. <laughs> that would be really fun. I you know I I had not actually thought of this until you mentioned it uh, because I, I think the thing the reason it's never bothered me is just because both climbers have such an have an equal likelihood of falling so it kind of it yeah. evens it out um, it, um, and it does make it a little more exciting I think that that the the margin for error is so is not only the margin for error is not only the actual physical performance um comparable to like running or cycling but it's also gravity like it, it's it's mm-hmm. you know you have this this external factor um and well, let me let me just the one that like really pissed me off was at the end of women's speed climbing you had two falls like so Anik falls in the small finals so it just gives up the bronze medal to somebody else and Yulia Kaplina fell in semi so in like the final races where you're giving away medals it was from somebody falling and I understand it's the highest pressure race and it's a thing that happens, but it really like to me personally, it felt like it kind of invalidated the result and you won 
a medal because you were the last person standing, which is not really not really the point of this, right? I want to see a nail biting race to the top. And if this, and I'm sure speed climbers have to balance this reality of, okay, you want to go fast on one hand, but on the other hand, you want to make sure you're stable, that you're within this like safe zone of not being, you know, flailing everywhere. Um, I, that must be a, a terribly difficult line to walk, but from a viewer perspective, it was like, oh, okay. So we just awarded a medal because you just managed to like, hold on. I don't know. That that was kind of frustrating for me. Again, I'm not offering any solutions. I'm just complaining about stuff that I have no control over. Um, but uh, yep. yeah, I felt like it was a bummer. The only solution I could think of in the in the current form of speed climbing would be you'd have to have every every single run, every single heat um, would have to be the best two out of three. But that would make speed climbing. I mean, it would take like two days, you know, to do the speed climbing portion. But you'd have to have every runner against or every you know every every climber against their component mm -hmm. would have three would have three races three yeah runs. and I, I i again without having enough i'm sure you and i would both agree that would probably be like crazy tiring yeah. if, if you add more races so i get that that's probably not practical um i don't know something like going into like a it wouldn't eliminate falls but changing it from a single elimination bracket to like a double elimination bracket where you get a second chance effectively i don't really know i don't know what the solution is maybe it does come down to changing the route in the long term whenever they get around to that but uh it was something that bummed me out i don't want to stay on this too long because neither of us can really offer uh solutions for it um but uh but yeah i, I did you have any any feedback from the speed event that you were psyched about uh you know i I, I'll just say full disclosure now, since we're talking about it, that was my favorite moment of the comp was Yiling Song's um, world record because um, it 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 just made the speed portion more interesting. To be honest, uh, it's, it, I think you and I are like a lot of viewers when we watch these things. Speed is is not our favorite discipline you know as much as you and i like anybody that analyzes these things you try to not have favorite disciplines but it's just like it have you know speed is not it's not what i grew up i didn't grow up speed climbing so it's not the thing that i connect with the most um so i usually just kind of like watch the speed climbing but then get really into the bouldering or the lead climbing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, I got to come, come back on that because, and a lot of it is probably time zone related, but I am finding it way easier to watch a one hour event that goes by quickly where the progress is obvious. There's a bracket on the screen so I can see who's against who and why they're where they are and what they have to do to like win. Um, mm -hmm. That is way easier to deal with than a four hour finals event with, yeah scoring that might be wonky and scoring not being up all the time and it being at 4 30 in the morning so of of this event the speed event fit best into my lifestyle it was the one where i wasn't looking at my phone the entire time which i was during semis uh and especially in finals it's the one where i didn't speed up the youtube playback to get through it faster like it was it was one where i sat down and i it had my full attention for an hour um, yeah. so, you know, I can, it's the one I can speak about the least, although I'm trying to get better. It's yeah. the one I have the least personal experience with, and I have no personal connection with any speed athletes, but it's winning me over super, super fast. And Eddie was talking on uh, Niall Grimes podcast last week. Um, and Eddie did a great job of representing competition climbing mm -hmm. to a very non-competition audience in that podcast. So big shout yeah. out to Ed for that. Uh, but he made the great argument of, you know, you would take a speed final over a lot of different climbing events, right? Like depending on the situation of a boulder <clears> final <throat> or a lead final, speed is quick and dirty and it gets you in and out and it's exciting the whole time. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can't make much more of an argument for that. It's an excellent event. I'm gaining a huge, I mean, I've, I consider myself a speed fan now, which I wouldn't have said that a couple years ago. Uh, and it sounds like Eddie, listening to that podcast, it sounds like he was kind of the same way. And I would imagine a lot of people that watch these competitions are the same way. It's like they've they've had this sort of growing acclimation and appreciation now for speed climbing. Um, and how can you not get excited then when a world record is getting broken? Like mm -hmm. that's a 
that's that's huge. That's and a great question. We should ask Yiling Song, who did that like that arm cheer on the wall and then came yeah. down was a completely blank face. That was the most disappointing part. Well, is I that was like an incredible accomplishment, and then there was yeah. nothing at all until like when you saw her with her coaches and her friends and stuff. Um, but I was like, you did a thing make a face yeah well it's weird because it happened in an early heat right and i sure. think that's it i remember like going <clears throat> that's a really good point actually you know yeah. when i used to when i used to be really into like i covered some some running some track and field stuff and it's it's kind of the same way where sometimes records get broken um in like a qualifying heat or something and it's like right. there's not much time to celebrate and you sure. almost don't want to celebrate too much because it kind of breaks your your focus your concentration uh because at the end of the day these competitors, uh, they're not there to break records. They're there to win. Sure. Right. That's like, a, that's I, an extremely good point. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's almost like it's, it's kind of interesting because I think in the long term history remembers the record, the record breakers, but in the short term, the thing that matters to these competitors is winning the gold medal and, uh, Yiling song, this world record, it was just a, it's like, it was a step along the way, but it's like, you don't want to celebrate when you're not actually there to your goal yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so yeah, it was she was she did seem a little subdued, but I kind of understand, uh, maybe without without having talked to her, I kind of understand. Um, I c I can imagine why she would have been that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a viewer, it was just it's exciting. It's exciting that we're actually seeing these these world records getting broken fairly regularly in mm -hmm. speed climbing, and I think we should appreciate that as a fan base because that's something that's not going to happen. Um, you know, a couple years from now, certainly 10 years from now, like these, these records, because speed climbing is kind of this new discipline in its current form. I mean, um, you, you know, we're, we're seeing this, this current iteration, all these records are being set, but at some point that's going to plateau. Um, so the fact that we are, we are able to watch, I mean, there's, it's not, it's not out of the question to say that some people might in the future watch comp climbing for 10 years and never see a, a speed world record getting broken. Sure. And um, this, so let me bring this up. Uh, a couple months ago, there was a round table at Innsbruck, I think, where they had, uh, what's her name, Silvia Vertolini and a few other representatives of the IFSC and industry people talking about where like the future of sport climbing was going. And one point that came up was how speed climbing is very likely going to be on a four year rotation for the route where the route could change after every Olympic games with the, the pace that first of all, that we're seeing world records broken, but also the innovation of how people climb the route. I feel like it's too soon if we change it after 2020. And I don't know if their plan is to like, maybe they're going to hold off on that. Maybe that was just an idea, but their intent at the time that they gave this, this, uh, uh, this panel was that they were looking at a four year cycle. I want it around for a couple more years. Like I really want to see what these next generation of athletes can do to like break this route and start in like, you know, they're already skipping what two, two handholds, I think one towards the bottom, one towards the top. I want to see where they can go further. I think it's like, I think that's the best part about this sport is actually being able to compare people's beta where they've been given years to develop what their beta will be rather than bouldering where they're given seconds to develop mm -hmm. their beta on a problem. Um, so I, I really hope this, this particular formation stays around for one or two more Olympic cycles. Uh, I've had a blast as a newcomer learning about how that beta has evolved. Um, and that's something that maybe I'll share with other people or maybe somebody else that's more speed native should share is talking about how, you know, five years ago, this was the beta four years ago, it changed to this. And this is why, and this is where we think it's going to go in the future. Like that would be really excellent content. Um, but yeah, that's a ter terrible idea. Changing the speed course, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. I mean, think about it. Like in track and field, you know, you don't every few years say, okay, now we're going to change it to the 210 meter dash. And oh, now I don't think later, that's analogous. <clears throat> but why but why would you change it I, I mean i don't understand like like why i don't i don't see the logic <laughs> let people let it be consistent so people can have that benchmark for for years that they can work towards sure. um now I... if if they would want to i could maybe understand um adding an additional speed course so maybe you would have like a short speed run and a long speed run or something like yeah. that because it is not out of the question to think that some competitors might be better at a course that's 10 or 15 meters higher. Whereas it, just like sprints and, and, you know, distance. Who's going to, who's going to build that building, the 25 meter speed route. 
Uh, but well, anyway, okay. So first of all, I I apps I have to disagree with you. So one is. I think like this route is was an experiment, right? Nobody knew how long this thing was going to get used, yeah. and very quickly they discovered that okay, we actually kind of fucked up some parts of it, and we should have rotated that hold, and we kind of like we kind of messed some of this stuff up. So I think it is like it has. Sh I think everybody has learned a ton about speed climbing since they created the homologated route, and so. As much as I want to see a little bit more from it, I totally understand if they say, okay, we learned a decade of lessons on this baby, and now we know what our goals are with speed climbing. Like straight up, if we were to design a new speed route today, you would have so many different choices to make. One would be like, okay, this thing is a, I don't know what people call it, like a 10D or an 11C, I can't remember what the grade is, but it's a fairly juggy route, but everything's far apart. Would you say, okay, let's make this harder by starting to put some more crimps or more slopers so that you have to really commit to every move? Do you want to shrink the distance between it so that the route becomes more accessible to beginners? Like for me, if I was opening a gym, I would 100% put a speed wall in it right away because that would be an incredible recreational draw for people. But the current speed route is terrible for people that are just like walking into a gym for the first time and want to use the auto belays. What if the like international speed route was very accessible for starters, but took an incredible level to master, right? Like, I, I think the decisions you could make if you redesign the route would be really consequential and could really change the industry in a lot of good ways, but you could, you could really change up the competition as well. So as much as I want to see more cycles with this one, just a couple more, I mm -hmm. think the next one could be like, it could be a really huge deal. I could, I could understand because of all the things you said, and anybody who wants to research this, there's a really interesting history about the current speed wall and kind of the route setting of it. Um, but, okay, if you would want to change it, fine. But that's it. Change it once, and then have that be the standard. Um, I mean, you you talk about like maybe I don't adding, disagree necessarily. You, you maybe adding some slopers and stuff, and I could see that logic, but that's gonna make it. You're gonna just have more falls then, which is the the very sure. thing that that you were just saying is kind of something that's that's not as as uh, sort of aesthetically pleasing as a viewer to watch that's like the, these falls. So you're you're in a really tricky spot. I will say that I know from coaching kids that when kids want to start um, speed climbing even on like here in the U S on the national circuit, the really young kids, they just go up like a jug hall sure. and that's their speed route. They don't, they don't attempt this, you know, the, the IFSC's kind of standard speed wall, um, which that might be another conversation. Maybe, you know, the development of some sort of like youth speed wall that's, that's maybe different and more accessible, but standardized. There is a guy out in BC, Simon Parton, who I'm, I'm going to give him credit. And mm -hmm. maybe there's other people that were involved as well. But Simon did a lot of work on standardizing a speed route that was, I think it's 10 meters uh, and it's for youth. So it's basically adding more holds to it, but it's all the standard speed holds. Uh, if anybody wants to check it out, go to Climb Canada. Dot ca whatever the canadian it's in the rule book at the back of the canadian rule book you will find the the official mock-up for it it's a very cool step i hope it gets used in canada now that it's been published uh, it only got published like a couple months ago um but yeah i think that that is a very important thing that needs to be addressed because you're right the current route is not good to start on and i don't think that's you know, I think I think it's possible to have a route that serves the very highest level as well as it does uh, the very beginners. I also think it's going to be odd if you change the current speed wall because you have all of these competitors who have worked for years to do that muscle memory and kind of get those those specific moves dialed in. Um, and then all of a sudden, if you do a new, a, a totally different speed wall, um, it's almost going to be advantageous then for people that are fresh to speed climbing and have no it's like they don't have to unlearn all this other stuff that they learn the you know I, i'm sure i'm sure the current speed climbers have like some transferable skills like i feel like they have a much yeah. better body awareness but yeah I, I like i i get the point of kind of invalidating all this history it would be hard um but it might be I worth just, it i just think you're gonna run into then a lot of complaints controversy if you if you totally change it and then what's to make of like all these all these records then it's just like these are isolated in time and lost uh, lost to the sands of the ifsc yeah, database see, history 
One Which, okay, the- straight up, you mentioned that, like, records stand the test of time or whatever. I don't know who had the record before the current published record holders, and I'm pretty sure there's, like, no way official to find out. So I, like, I don't... I don't know if that's a convincing argument for me because it's not like we do a good job of actually like celebrating that stuff already. Um, well, but. and I mean, th- one of the things again, going back to to like track and field, right? Let's that's a that for the speed portion. That's like a, it's it's an easy it's like a good comparison in some ways. Um, one of the things that I think is really fun is to go back and look at these records, the, look at the times from the 1930s, look at the times from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Um, and I think, so we have to think of this, not just in the current time, but look at this a hundred years in the future or something like this, assuming the sport continues to grow. Don't, don't we want to have those people in the future running the same course that we are now for just for the sake of comparison and having some, some kind of heritage to the sport. Um, I I think it's, it's just, it's weird if you're every four years or five years or 10 years, even if you're just changing it and it's like a completely new, I mean, that's what makes that's what makes speed climbing unique from bouldering or lead climbing, right? Is that the, the wall is, it's going to stay the same, yeah. the setting. Um, so I, I don't, I don't disagree with you. I like how fired up you are about this. Actually. I, I don't think I've seen you like this passionate about it. Well, a, and it's, it's about interesting topic. because I don't, I mean, I, I <laughs> certainly don't think that the current speed route is, is like perfect route setting. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of, a lot of problems with it. Um, and a lot of areas where you could, you could really criticize it, but it's the cards we were dealt. You got to stick with it. You can't sure. just, you know, you can't, uh, it's like, it's not perfect, but it's what we have. Yeah. And, and maybe you could convince me, okay, we, we should change it so we can get it as close to perfect as possible. Okay. Maybe, but then you can't, you got to stick with it, um, yeah. to create some lineage of the sport. That's yeah, that's fair. Okay. Let's talk about bouldering. Cause we're like 56 yeah. minutes in. And I don't think we've actually addressed the bouldering round. First of all, if uh, if anybody was, uh, uh, do I have a video of it? Anyway, the boulder round was uh, was basically a Gecko King festival. If you're a hold nut, it was a very very Chinese set of climbs. I think like every round, every problem was all Gecko King holds. Uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of them, especially like the donuts and the and the partial donut pinches. Um, it was for the most part monochromatic. It had an interesting style. It was clearly not European or North American. It was, you know, something else. Uh, but in terms of the climbing, it was like a fairly average event in terms of number of tops, number of flashes. It was, you know, pretty, pretty run of the mill in terms of how it went. Um, on the women's side, you know, again, Yanya dominated, although it could have been close, I guess. She actually had to put some work into some of the problems. She didn't flash them all. Um, on the men's side, I think the big story is Tomoa could have won this thing. He just forgot how to start a boulder problem on uh, men's number three, which is a, a huge pain in the ass because he's been he's been without a win for a while. Um, yeah. And he gave it up to Manu Cornu, who deserved it. He did a great job. But uh, yeah, on men's number three, it was kind of a, you kind of like run into a, a vert wall, into a bit of a, a press position. And he, uh, he tapped his left foot out to a non-marked volume before bringing it back in. And mm-hmm. that single attempt is what cost him the win. If he hadn't done that, he would have just flashed the thing and uh, he could have taken first place, but no go. So harsh. It's interesting because remember just a couple, I think it was Moscow or maybe it was Meiringen. The first one we were, it was a slow start for the French team, right? They didn't get any competitors. Mm-hmm. I think the men didn't get any into the semifinals, if I remember correctly. Um, and so we were kind of talking about you know, oh, it's too early to say the French team should be worried, but it certainly it was uncharacteristic at the time that mm-hmm. they didn't have any competitors uh, make it to the finals. Here, uh, yeah, Manu, he, you know, it was a great victory for him. Uh, puts kind of France back on the map a little bit uh, in the men's division. They had been on the map previously because Fanny has had a pretty good season in the women's division. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just kind of this is, I mean, you sort of think about at some point at somewhere in the top in the like the top tier competitors at all these events you kind of expect that there probably will be a, a french competitor in, um and and they're really so so it's just um you know good for manu it was a good good victory for him good victory for for france too the, the and something team. just because i was thinking of it he was like he was fairly emotive after some uh, uh some problems and the cameras did a good job of picking up a lot of noise like we we were talking in the last episode about how hearing climbers react um, and hearing the ambience of a climbing wall um, would kind of add 
to to the broadcast and it was nice seeing him kind of be really psyched after some rounds um mm-hmm. and being able to hear that yeah he was he was a cool winner i he that he looked scary he looked extremely determined going into that men's four problem knowing that if he flashed it he guaranteed a win turns out he didn't need it um yeah. but uh that was a, a <laughs> he's an intimidating looking dude now that he's got all the facial hair yeah that's right he yeah and and uh he yeah, I don't know. I don't have much to add. It was just, I really liked mm-hmm. it. Good for him. Yeah. You know? um, on the on the women's side, like in terms of problems overall, did any of the final problems leave you with like a lasting impression? Because that was the one thing that I felt disconnected from this time around is that I didn't come out of it with uh, with like a particularly memorable problem. And after rewatching all of it, I think the one that sticks with me the most is women's number four. But only because it has the sequence is kind of unique in that it's almost like a system problem. It's almost the kind of thing you'd put up in a gym to just like prove you're strong or not. It wasn't it wasn't like aesthetic bouldering or anything like that. It was like, hey, do this like pre-. anyway. Um, did you have any problems before I talk about mine? Did you have any <clears throat> impressions for the men or for just the either? Women's, are you- yeah, either um, men or women. I really like. Let me look at my notes here. So my. My favorite problem overall was um, was men's two. Okay. And it, it, it's to just kind of jog people's memory. It started with kind of this mantle, um, and then you kind of pressed one. I think it was you know a left hand. Maybe you pressed your left hand, uh, and then this and then the upper section got pretty steep, and there were like some feet being cut. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not doing a very good job of describing it, but people can go back and, and and check it out. It's men's number two. I I liked it for a couple different reasons. It was my favorite for for one, one thing. Before the competitors started on it, um, Charlie Bosco was kind of saying how it was really hard to read it, um, which was really cool. Like it's nice that it's it just had sort of an enigmatic quality to it. Um, it was not very clear. The the beta was not clear right away that Mm -hmm. was fun um it also had a really exciting move at the top if people recall the you had to like do a a hand and then you had to really quickly get your other hand to match at the top while your feet were popping so it had kind of this dynamic quality to the to the finish of it um and it just was really big this this could probably be said for for most of the problems in china but it was really big holds volume holds but a lot of the a lot of the movement was really kind of small micro nuanced mm-hmm. movement sure. um and i think that's a this was an interesting <clears throat> comp because for, for for a lot of the holds that were being used they are extremely subtle like slopers and pinches and so even though these were large holds there were a lot of moves where the moves weren't very dynamic and you had these moments where you were just like trying to figure out how to keep body tension while like tap matching your hand up this pinch uh but also like crimps showed up especially in semifinals. Uh, and in women's, I think it was women's number one, if I remember right, had all these like little ass crimps on there that you could barely see. Um, I might be confusing semis and finals again, like it didn't leave much of an impression. Um, but it, it was cool to see some, some of those moves come through, I think. And I've got a replay of it. My, this is definitely my favorite. I think this is the most like beautiful type of move that you can find in a bouldering competition. I thought this was going to be my favorite problem, but I think I've decided that women's number four is, but I just, this like foot above the head, like balance press out. This is my jam. It reminds me of Rei Sugimoto. Just something about it is I love how elegant this kind of move is. And especially how Akio deals with like cutting this tension. I thought she was going to have to do a huge swing out of this, but instead just the most like graceful match through here, unreal body tension. This, this was going to be my favorite problem, but uh, I think I have to give it to, to women's number four, even though I didn't cut video of that, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. She just made this look like amateur. So chill. Anyway. She she did, and that's actually her send of that boulder is actually my honorable mention for the moment. The cool. Favorite moment. I, I, I As I said previously, I, I think my favorite moment was probably Yiling Song's world record in the speed climbing, yeah. but honorable mention. Just I, I mean, I was just, I think... I was watching Akio do that climb, and it was just one of those moments where I I caught myself just like mouth agape, yeah. like I was holding my coffee in my hand, just like just like watching it uh, in awe because she just was so calm and methodical, mm-hmm. and um, just the the poise that she had throughout the whole sequence. Um, it was kind of like like if you had to pick a boulder that's quintessential Akio and is like a good 
uh, encapsulation of why she is, as we were saying earlier, like arguably the best ever or one of the best ever, undoubtedly. Um, that boulder, it's like that's an that's her send of that boulder is so. Uh, it was just so her. It's a great. You know? It's yeah. It is a great little like it's, avatar it's for her entire climbing. Yeah. Right. The, the flexibility and the body tension, and then there's like this little hop that looks so controlled the whole yeah. time. It was just <laughs> like like you could. If 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 she was like silhouetted, so you couldn't see who it was, and you just watched the person send it, you'd be like, yeah, that's definitely Akio, because sure. there's just something about the way that she sent it. Um, yeah, it was just awesome. Yeah. Uh, speaking of like mentions for best moment, I'd probably agree with you that it was the it was the. Um the record being broken. I did actually clip this just because this is like such a good show of, of Sean McCall just having a good time in a boulder comp. This is him semifinal uh, men's number one, and uh, just his dismount on this was uh, was really graceful. And honestly, if if climbing had style points, I think he'd he'd be a contender for world champion. He tries to do like a tr tries not to use the hands at all. Takes a toss, turns that little somersault. <laughs> Love it. Got the arms out. Perfect form. Anyway, yeah, yeah. It, it, the only great. thing it was missing is him taking a bow afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was. I think he's a, he's a former gymnast, isn't he? Uh no, I think he's he, not. Well, I I'm sure he did a ton of yeah. gymnastics parallel stuff or whatever. But I think he was yeah. like as a kid, he was a soccer player, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Um, but yeah. So anyway, well, so I, I love that moment. Dramatic, soccer has dramatic falls in its own right, but that's different. You're trying to draw cards in that case. That's but, yeah. That's very true. You know? That's not... um, but yeah, I remember I noted that when, when I was watching it, I was like, that was a really, you know, that was a cool, <laughs> a cool little backwards somersault tumble. Yeah. Uh, Yo, yeah, speaking of, speaking of just that, because I think Kyra Condi was commentating for that. We had like two Americans and one Canadian helping out with the commentary. So go us. Um, I personally think Alison Vest of Canada did the best job. Um, Alison Vest is just a really funny person. She was actually, she was in Toronto. So she has a, she has a black diamond sponsorship. And she was telling me about how uh, they have like athlete profiles on a website or somewhere for all these athletes. And, you know, she was saying how, you know, some of them are, you know, this person is a, a world champion, uh, like uh, BMX guy or mountain biking guy. And this person has this incredible history of trail running. And then hers starts out with like Allison Vest, best known for hilarious Instagram videos of her like falling off boulders or whatever. And she was just like laughing about how, how that's how she ends up getting, uh, getting known for things. She is a genuinely funny person, aside from being one of the strongest climbers in Canada, won the national championship last year. Um, but uh, no, I really liked having her on with, uh, with Charlie because I think she brought out uh, a couple laughs from him i think she did a good job and of course excellent analysis of the climbing you can't overstate that yeah i think so it was nathaniel coleman uh kyra condi uh and then allison vest right those were the, yeah. the americans and the canadians that were on uh were on commentary i i thought they did a fantastic job now it's like we said before you and i are kind of biased here no uh, but i i and in particular, there was a moment when I was wa when I was listening to Kyra Condi, and she was explaining how I think she was talking about Akio, how Akio has this this tendency when she when her feet cut, uh, she like oh the swings, scorpion move yeah she does like the scorpion move to kind of like control to keep her upper body controlled, and it was just this it was awesome insight, and I was thinking like this is the type of like explanation that you that people would pay money for at like a climber's <laughs> clinic to have yeah. this kind of detail about about uh climbing technique and and here kyra condi is just is just saying it like offhandedly on <laughs> commentary free. and um, that, that one really resonated because you know uh, akio is somebody that we've watched for a really long time the second she said that you like i've seen that a million times off akio yeah. i'd never put together like why she did it if it was particularly unique to her but she did a great job of condensing what was like a thing that was out there um and making it articulate so that was really cool same thing kind of with nathaniel is that offering like really really um minute insight into little things um mm -hmm. and of course with his tone of voice and stuff it's like it's very uh it's very like I don't. It's not Yoda ish. I sh shouldn't say that. Um, but uh, but really interesting insights. I'm glad they were able to speak. I wish the mic had been louder. If you watch the first, just if you want to have a weird, if you have an awkward sense of humor like I do, just watch the first like five minutes of semifinals where Nathaniel and Charlie are speaking to each other. Except Nathaniel's mic is off completely. Yeah. So it's just Charlie sounding like he's talking to nobody i yeah it was a pretty good laugh there me. was also a moment where uh, i think it was 
in semifinals, uh, the ambient noise, like the noise from the wall and the crowd cut out, and it was just Charlie and, and Kyra Condi talking, and all of a sudden, with that noise gone, it just yeah. sounds like we're like eavesdropping on like a really private like yeah. phone conversation between yeah. Kyra and Charlie. <laughs> like all of a sudden, they're just like, they're, they just sound like really close. Uh, it, it was just kind of, and then, you know, the sound came back on, but for yeah. like a couple minutes there, it was kind of like, oh, this is, this is sounds a little different yeah uh, Pro- production wise let's talk about that because the yeah. unique thing for these two world cups in china uh the production is being done by the chinese national broadcaster um so charlie is there as the english language commentator but they're basically just plugging his voice in over the video that they shoot and produce and all that kind of stuff um I think it was, I, I don't want to say it was necessarily better or worse than anything else. I, th- I think one thing that was noteworthy was the CGI. You mentioned this as a as a big point was how they were doing. Um, and I think it's, there's a guy from Japan and he does it. It's called online observation. And they've used that at some World Cups in the past and some like non-IFSC events. I think you mentioned that they did it at Vail a couple of years ago. Is that what you said? They I... did it in Japan. Uh, oh, in Hachioji, last yeah. Year. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but this this wasn't his system, I don't think. It didn't look the same, but it integrated really well with the broadcast. I've got a clip somewhere in here. But anyway, you've just got Kokoro climbing here and it's so well integrated just from that, you know, that key camera. And of course, this this shot isn't actually that great, but it was panning around and they were superimposing measurement graphics. You could see the distance between between like one hold and another. Uh, it was really well done and just how it faded in and out. It looked really professional, like boom, right there, you're back to reality. It was uh, pretty cool. Yeah, I have to give credit where it's due. I have been both in conversation and also even, I think in some writing stuff, I've been pretty critical in the past of these China World Cups because mm-hmm. Uh, anybody who remembers, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, but like consistently the stream quality is terrible. Um, and so I had even started to wonder like why, you know, I know that China is a big market, but it's, it's such a bad look to go there and then have such amateur production and have the viewership on YouTube get so frustrated watching these, these, these crummy streams. Yeah. Um, and, and yet this year it was kind of like a little redemption for, for the China st- you know the quality of the production. Uh, it was. I thought it was great. There were no no stream issues. Uh, of course, we have another. You know, Wu Jang is coming up, um, so we'll have to see. A chance to that, blow it all. But if, no, if, I. If that's as good. But I agree I, with but, you. We were talking about like waking up early for this stuff. Part of me was like, okay, I'm gonna wake up at 4:30, and then there's gonna be nothing to watch. It's just not gonna work out. But I think clearly there is. They're putting some more importance on it. The the profile of the sport has been raised enough that they've actually allowed us to have a working internet connection. So thank you to the party. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, good production. I was really, I mean, anytime that's been something I've been saying for a long time is that they should, you know, every, not just IFSC, but like every national comp should find some way to do 3d computer graphics. It makes a big difference. Uh, and there's people in every country that know how to do this stuff. Well, let, so, let me, cause I don't, I don't know if this is, um, the per- so there were basically two applications of it one was what you just saw which was they give you like a visual tour which can completely be accomplished using a camera if we're honest the impractical part is you have a cameraman walking on mats possibly in the zone of other climbers um, and something did come up where they had a cgi mock-up of one problem but they had shot it well before the round and the root setters had tweaked the root. So the CGI mock-up you had was actually like incorrect. Um, I think the thing that was less impressive at this event, but a better seed for something in the future was superimposing the measurements on the wall, because basically that's all you're doing is you have live action. You could actually see the climber, right? You weren't in some CGI world. It was a live shot with augmented reality stuff on it, which is like the holy grail of what we're looking for, especially lead climbing of, you know, Kokoro chalking up and on the wall projected there with uh, with animations is this is where this guy got, this is where this guy got, this is what he's got to do to win this problem. And when you go to lead climbing, obviously pointing out those high points consistently, that's the, like, that is the money right there. That would change how it feels to watch a lead event. So very cool, like, you know, seed of an idea, but you have to say, okay, this was run by CCTV. This was a very much Chinese thing. This wasn't the IFSC 
probably we're not going to see that at a lot of the the World Cups going forward, which is too bad. But it just shows that it's possible, which we knew already, I guess. Yeah, and then the next step to having it at every competition, which would be ideal, would be having it sort of standardized at every competition you know because like for example the the like you said the computer the 3d graphics from last year in japan looked very different from these 3d graphics and it's like it'd be nice if there's some consistency there you're not going to get that if they're being done by the individual um you know national television you know studios Mm -hmm. in all the different countries i think the, Uh, the problem is that those features that are arriving that's not the ifsc's doing that is other parties contributing right and right the online observation guy is not going to go to every world cup as far as i know he's self-funded um so you know it's for right now it's probably what we just have to we got to take what we can get um Mm -hmm. and hopefully the budget comes in to implement that on the IFSC side, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, all, all in all, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was pretty good. I also just, a just an honorable mention to Eddie Falk, who became the, the actual roaming reporter on the floor doing the athlete interviews so that Charlie yeah. doesn't have to like run from the booth, uh, back down to the ground. So shout out to Eddie for putting down the camera and picking up a microphone. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of it was goofy and funny, and some of the answers were uh, were pretty good. I liked his uh, his uh, his conversation with Yanya. As short and sweet as it was, but uh, yeah, so good for him to for trying something new. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of what else. If I had any other noteworthy things, I'm sure there's a lot that I'm forgetting. Um, all the Canadian stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Speed climbing. Well, it's kind of a nice, just just sort of an extension of this, since we're talking about the event, kind of in this panoramic form. You know, we might as well just say what we graded it. Sure. Uh, uh-huh. You go first. <laughs> okay. I graded it. Let me look at my notes here. Um, I gave it an A minus. Damn. Uh, that's uh, that's the same as Maringen, right? It is. And I wow. think it actually, some of the reasoning is, is, is because similarly to Maringen, which is, you know, it, it came down to the final boulder, which, which is great, right? Like Akio, uh, at least certainly in the men, I think the reason it gets an A minus and not an A for me is because the, it kind of came down to the final boulder, but then like, you know, it was like, there was this big buildup, like, Oh, if Manu can flash this, yeah. he's going to win. And then he didn't flash it, but then like nobody else did either. And so at the end it's like, Oh, well, we'll tabulate back on attempts and okay, Manu wins anyway. And yeah. Now, like I agree. Up. It came down to the last boulder, but it didn't come down to the last boulderer, right? Like right, the, right. it was given up, everybody failed. And then you have the last guy coming out, Angie, right? He was the final seed. He, I think. And so it's, it always sucks when the last guy coming out has no chance to win. He's playing for some other medal or if a medal at all. So it wasn't, yeah, that, that part wasn't perfect. The women's one was better. Although I, I had no doubt in my mind that Yanya was going to top, uh, number four. Like it was pretty obvious. Um, so there wasn't much suspense on that one. Yeah. But I mean, Akio did put some, some heat on Yanya. I mean, it was like it, as much as we, it was maybe kind of assumed that Yanya would top it. It did come down to that boulder. Sure. Um, which, which I thought was nice. I, I don't know. Maybe like if there was some like nebulous <laughs> space between like a B plus and an A minus, that's okay. probably where this this one would go. What I was it? Okay, go back to elementary school. What was B plus was like seventy eight percent, and A minus was eighty two. Is does that sound right? No, no, no. So in 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 the U.S., <laughs> um, we surprised we had different school systems. I never systems. thought about this. It was like so A was. A minus was 90, 90 in the nineties was an A, A minus oh. or A, eighties was B's, seventies was C's, sixties was D's, and then in the fifties or below was an F, I think. Okay, in Canada uh, you could definitely have a B and still be in the seventies. Okay. Uh, that said, uh, this is like decades ago and uh, and I was such a straight A student, I have no idea what a C feels like, so whatever. <laughs> well, I, I didn't think about that, having different, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> Whatever the grade is, I thought it was a pretty good competition. How much whole, did the you know? speed event affect your grade overall? Because my my thing is the bouldering part was, I don't want to say it was a subpar event, but I wasn't psyched the entire time. And that could be just because we're getting into the season. The time zone was weird. I didn't feel super engaged, but the speed event made up for it. Yeah, it was huge for my grade. If, if we hadn't had that broken world record, uh, the competition wouldn't have been nearly as interesting to me. Yeah. Um, 
I'm, I'm thinking, especially going forward, I'm starting to think of like, well, speed is, it's like a speed and bouldering world cup. So speed is yeah. half of it. Yeah. Right. Even though we don't focus on speed as much for these recaps. Uh, I think we spent way more. We spent all the time on speed for this one, yeah. as it turns but, out. But, but yeah. And rightly so. It's a new world record. You yeah. know, like that's a big deal. But um, but the speed was really compelling and it had a monumental moment. If that hadn't happened. Yeah. The competition wouldn't have been ranked nearly as high for me. Um, but. Uh, you know, the speed was great. I thought the setting was pretty good. I like the polarization of the boulders. It's like they were these, they were like huge volumes and also these tiny crimps, tiny jibs. That was kind of neat. Um, kind of both ends of the spectrum there. Yeah, that's uh, fair. And this, and, and I liked all the production stuff that goes into it too. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, and I, I, I feel like I am being, my decision is being skewed by, how difficult this was as a viewer for the North American audience. And I'm just going to straight up admit that, like, guess what? I haven't written down my criteria for what makes a World Cup good. Too too bad. It's going by feel. Uh, For me, if you combine both of them, I think I would probably give it like a B. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think the speed was the best part by far. That said, it was the part that I could watch at a pretty, you know, normal time. It had great storylines. It was a single hour. Um semifinals was pretty lackluster all around even though it had canadians in it and then finals was at a terrible time and i didn't feel like many stories came out of finals it wasn't thrilling i i like i kind of like two times sped it up um yeah it didn't again it didn't leave much of an impression so i'm gonna give it a b the speed was great the speed on its own i think i would have given it like an a straight up and then the bouldering world cup on its own would probably be like a b minus um yeah it's kind of interesting because it's we've sort of reversed last week because if you remember like Moscow, I was kind of just la- lackluster about it and you seem to like it a lot more than I did. Yeah. Cause there was a uh, fucking rocket ship dong and balls right. on the wall. Yes. What's there to not like? Yes. Our goal, our, our, our unspoken goal is to try to reference that opening ceremony for every single recap that we do going forward. I'm going to make it the logo uh, for this show when we redesign the overlay. But it's interesting because you were not, uh, are you, let's see, I was not that impressed. Not, I don't want to say not impressed, but just like you, you enjoyed that comp a lot more than I did, uh, if I remember correctly. And this, and it sounds like it's kind of the opposite this way. Um, sure. I give this one pretty high marks. I, th- I thought, uh, you know, I come away from it. Uh, I don't know what else I could have wanted out of a, out of a competition. You know, it, like it had good setting. It, it came down to the final boulder. It had uh, a mix of some veterans, some newer names, uh, kind of, I guess. I'm looking at it now. It, not really newer names. I suppose it was all kind of people that we would we've seen before. Those, yeah, but, I, but um, like, okay. So just straight up, and we're gonna wrap this up soon. But sure. in the last problem, so for the men, I agree that there was suspense. Um, but then it finished with, you know, like Anzi not doing much. For the women, there was no did, like. Did you really think there was a chance that Yanya wasn't gonna top that final problem? Because that for me, like I wasn't, I wasn't on the edge of my seat. I wasn't giving any thought to anything other than, yeah, Yanya's going to win this. It's like in the bag. Well, she didn't flash it, right? Sure. And so I think like that opens up the door for maybe she won't. Like if she, you know, once she starts an attempt and then fails on it, you know, like I think that kind of opens up like, wow, well maybe she will struggle on this. Uh, I, I think you should always, the default thinking should always be that Yanya will top something <laughs> until proven otherwise. Uh, it, 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 just this season, that seems to be the way it's going. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, could it have ended a little more with a little more exciting finish? Yes. Which is probably why I gave it, you know, an A minus or B plus or whatever. Not, not an A. Um, but sure. uh, that was the biggest thing for me is that I didn't feel very invested in a viewer mm-hmm. in the finals. Yeah. And like I said before, it might be because the hour was terrible, um, but it didn't it just didn't catch me. Like, yeah. that's uh, that's pretty much it. That's my yeah. that's my argument. Um, I realized that we were very complimentary of Charlie Bosco and Eddie Falk uh, in this in this episode. And since they both disagreed with me last week about swearing in comps, because um, we were talking about how uh, it would be nice to have more noise from the athletes. And Eddie and Charlie both commented that, you know, the language would be colorful if we had like shotgun mic the problems. Um, I just want to say I completely disagree. I got into climbing because 
it was unique and it felt like people were being themselves and not, you know, restricting themselves to some like very clean kind of adult thing. Like rock climbing was rough around the edges. Everybody was just kind of being themselves and it had personality and it became part of my personality because I was so intrigued by how cool it was. And I feel like the spectator experience of climbing right now is not representative of who people actually are in climbing. Like I know, Mm -hmm. I know Eddie and Charlie are colorful dudes and have great personalities. And there's parts of that that they can't show on a broadcast, which is very standard for the sporting world. But the value of this sport, especially to the Olympics is the younger audience that it's bringing in, right? Like if we need the Olympics, like if we as climbers need the Olympics, the Olympics needs us just as much uh, as we need them. They need younger viewership coming in. And nothing impresses people and gets people more genuinely engaged in something than feeling like it has actual personality and that they are a part of it. And I feel like for young people, the best way to do that is to show personality and be honest with yourself and be who you are. And climbing, I think most of us would agree that at some point in our lives, we felt like we were outsiders um, in one way or another. And I think that is a a feeling that most people can relate to. Um, I feel like, and again, this is my opinion, so everybody can disagree all they want, but I wish we could be a little bit more honest about who we are and be a bit more colorful in the broadcast. I think long-term, that would do more to grow an identity and grow engagement for the sport than being polite just so that we don't piss off like the the adults who have apparently never heard any cursing before and i think it's a hard change to go from a clean broadcast charlie made a point that it it triggers you when you hear something because part of you is like oh that sounded weird like i'm i'm very used to hearing people you know cursing but in a broadcast something feels different but that's only because that's the culture we've raised we've only like you know we can turn that off anytime we want so i personally wish that climbing was a little bit different, but you know, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. I would love to hear the climbers just cursing away, being who they are. I would love to hear commentators or analysts not always being, you know, completely sunny about everything and and being a bit more critical, especially as climbers start to get paid and become professionals. Yeah, be critical of them. Say like that was a garbage attempt. Tomoa, you're a pro at this. Why the fuck couldn't you match your two feet? Like you know how to boulder. You've won world championships before. You threw away a gold medal on a problem that you flashed because you didn't match your feet. That's stupid. Like mm-hmm. I, don't, I think he can handle that criticism. I think we can handle the language that was probably going through his head. So that's that's to, ma- that's to make up for us being too nice to Charlie and Eddie through the rest of this episode. <laughs> well, climbing is not the only sport that's kind of dealing with this identity question because sure. it's, and the other uh, one of the other sports that if I if I'm remembering correctly, one of the other sports that's going to be in these 2020 Olympics new sports is is skateboarding, and I uh, you know talk about like colorful character sure. right and, and sort of like this uh kind of subculture um rebellious whatever you want to call it um all, and now having to suddenly kind of like find like what is its identity in the context of the olympics yep. and in the, you know um so this is something that i'm sure other sports are having to think about as well uh and it take a take a sport like snowboarding which definitely went through the same growing pains and they had a very dramatic story of like how they got into the olympics but the, like you look at that community and the relationship they had with skiing and you could definitely say that snowboarders felt like they probably weren't being represented in the early days yeah the pr- the problem that you get into with this though is it, you, i think especially in terms of like media and marketing you know there there are a handful of different categories and climbing is like kind of this in between a couple of different categories but in terms of like mainstream media it gets forced into these other categories so it's like it's either it it either can be be whittled into this category of like sport right like sort of like olympic the olympic ideal and whatnot or this other category that the that the sort of mainstream likes to place something is like extreme sport which climbing is not but uh and they but they've tried it's it's been kind of forced to play that role i'm thinking specifically in like the x games of the 1990s and stuff Mm -hmm. um and that just doesn't last either because people realize eventually that you know climbing doesn't belong in the same context as like bungee jumping or something (laughs) like that Um, how do you compete anyway well and so it's so climbing it's this really weird balance of um of kind of 
I don't know, for lack of a better word, kind of like this rebellious subculture, but also this this uh, this sport, you know, and and um, so I I don't know. But it was great that Eddie and Charlie chimed in. That was awesome. To get yeah, their thoughts on yeah, it. that was that was. I appreciate uh, them uh, them bothering to watch. I feel like they probably have watched enough rock climbing that they don't need to hear two guys talk about it. But I appreciate I think them point, chiming in. I think Eddie's point about having, if you would want to do something like that, just having a, a five second delay, uh, that would be that sure. that would work fine. I mean, then you're going to have to have you're going to have to pay somebody to sit at the controls and 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 do that, um, which you know that's a that's another issue, but. Um, but yeah, why not? Just have somebody there pressing the mute button if the language gets too colorful. Um, yeah. Which I can't imagine the language would get too colorful because you would get you would risk getting yellow carded. For well, that. if it gets if it well, that's I personally disagree with that being a rule. Like I don't think you should be allowed to harass or abuse judges. I'm totally fine with yeah. that. But I'm like, don't give me a yellow card or a red card because you curse after falling. I or which, I don't or if you like smack the wall out of anger, that's hilarious. I want to watch that. Like too bad. Yeah, and maybe they don't. I don't. I haven't read the. You know, I it, is a thing. Rule, it is it, a thing. It is a thing for language. Yeah. yeah. For for okay. Yeah. Um, w- which is interesting. Then when Eddie says like the language is pretty colorful, and yet I can't recall ever seeing somebody get carded for language. So it's well, like I don't, obviously I, I don't think like I think it's the kind of thing where if it is just getting like ridiculous, then it's something that they can do to you. I think like in my experience in youth comps, that's something I've seen is like you know you have a teenager that's getting mouthy, and then the judge has to come over and say, hey, like shut up kid this is like a family experience right there's 11 year olds here can you shut up um but yeah it exists if needed i think i mean i think language is fine as long as it's not of course like you said directed towards an official or or another competitor or something like that um i you know yeah that's our sport that's people it's it's frustration and and not only venting the frustration but then like working through the frustration and 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 kind of still climbing well while you're kind of like just uh, you know all rattled like that's part of it and and that could be really compelling yeah i think that's uh, that's, highlighted. that's my argument is i'm not saying this has to be obscene i'm not saying climbing needs to be like the xfl where it's like intentionally yeah. trying to be borderline or whatever but i it hurts to see um some of the the genuine personality being taken out of the sport so i just wish it wasn't limited as much um, mm-hmm. All and all of this is just in the argument of putting microphones so that I can hear them yell when they top or smack a sloper. That's still all I want. Um, yeah. I don't care if they curse on the way there. Anyway, we're pretty much wrapped up. Anything you want to add? Uh, you know, I don't think so. We kind of one of the things that I wanted to bring up, which maybe we could talk later in the season, w- would be, you know, I just kind of wonder if uh, if Akio if Akio's dominance this is like so random but just if her if her if her success is kind of getting overshadowed by yanya's success which we kind of talked about in the beginning at the very beginning um but she has just been incredibly consistent this this season as well and um if it was not if yanya was it's weird to say but like if yanya wasn't part of this circuit um, I think we would we would be you know Akio would be moved into that slot as someone that everybody is buzzing about. Um, I think you should write the piece. I think I'm gonna drop I'm gonna drop it all on you. I'm gonna say I think you should write the thing like who uh, who deserves the most credit right now because I think that's a, a valid argument. But I think anything yeah. I think recap going right back to where we started. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> Yanya is making us start to talk about really big claims of what her success means, and I think it's time that we start trying to figure out how to um, quantify that and how to compare it against past people. So I would love to hear in the comments here if people would chime in and say like what should the criteria be for measuring the greatest, uh, the greatest of all time you know or or whatever you want to call it the mount rushmore of competition climbers or the hall of fame of competition climbers whatever kind of standard you want to set how do you determine uh what's the rubric for for that and and kind of figuring out who goes in and who belongs and who is the very best um i think that's a conversation that industry needs to have um we and it's it's just one thing i'll say just to us and i think we should like I have a feeling this is one of those spots where we're talking about it as if there's other people willing to do it. Like, who's the list of people in North America making content around climbing? And you kind of realize, okay, I'd like other people to step up, but it's kind of us, man. Yeah. 
Like yeah, I mean, mag- there's the magazines, Rock and Ice, and and Climbing Magazine, and G- and Jim Climber Magazine, and then you and I, and then there. But yeah, it is a small, you know, it's a small group for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I would just be so curious to hear what other people because there are. If you're thinking, let's let's even. I know we're kind of running out of time, but if let's even pan out from just. Yanya, just the single greatest. Let's talk about like the Mount Rushmore, right? The four greatest competition climbers of all time. Um, you know, who's who is it? You you run into the same, or like I said, Hall of Fame. If you wanted to induct a class, an inaugural class of five, the five greatest of all time for like the first Hall of Fame class for the IFSC, who is it? How do you measure that? I don't know. I I would say you know. Akio's up there. Jain Kim's up there. You can even go back. You have to almost go back to days before the IFSC. You do have right? to look at yeah. like Robin Herbisfield and yeah. I mean, there's there's a bunch of other people that you start talking about. Um, there's and that's the that's the thing is like if I I will admit it about myself. My perspective on those early days is extremely limited. Um, that's something where we need to be reaching out to people that were around or people that have been around for all of it and and start quantifying these things. A lot of the stats and the placing still exist. They're very hard to find. Um, They aren't in a format that makes it easy to like draw comparisons. It's not, you know, I, anyway, I think it's difficult to do, but I I think, uh, I think that's something that just the, the lack of ease to find information makes it much harder to tell these stories. So there is a ton of manual labor and data entry that goes into shout out Rockton Pro uh, that is required to actually tell these stories properly. And so it's time to dig down and I'm starting in one particular niche area of it. Um, if there are people asking these questions, I think it's time for us to do that. Like, let's let's start pulling this data and let's start trying to figure out, you know, how long was Francois Legrand relevant and who were the, you know, the ultimate champions of speed back in whenever and does their success bear any comparison to the speed climbers of today? I think that's, it's, you know, for, for the Olympics to matter, people are going to be asking a lot of questions about, you know, so what's been the deal in, in climbing? Who is the greatest? You know, the Olympics is going to crown somebody <clears throat> as an Olympian, but, you know, NBC is going to want to know more. They're going to want to have more context. And so if we can t- start telling those stories now, I think that adds a lot of value to the community. So that's up to us. And that's up to, you know, Jim Clymer and, and uh, you know, this place, that place, Eddie at the circuit. It is a small club. We could probably like fill, you know, a little uh, like a like a Skype group or whatever of a, a handful of people that are making content around competition climbing. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a small scene. We got to do a lot of work if we want to tell those stories, but it's got to come down to us. Yeah. And I think the biggest, like one of the, the, the most unfortunate things about all this is that there is a robust competition climbing history. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just easy for, because it's so hard to find and I've had a hard time finding it when I'm trying to research articles and stuff. Um, so it's so hard to find that, that I think new fans whether they're you know deep into it or not almost think that like it's a new competition climbing is kind of a new thing which it is not at all no uh but you wouldn't know that from kind of perusing whatever information is out there whatever data is out there on the on the internet um so yeah it's and it's also unfortunate that you know there are a number of climbing organizations that give grants for research projects but as far as i've found most of them give grants to projects related to like mountaineering and and that sort of thing i don't know you, if you mean anybody... from a, like a media research or do you mean like a like a scientific training research what do you mean this has become Probably. suddenly a podcast just you and me talking about stuff but whatever. well i don't think uh not so much scientific but just for like you know uh projects that people propose um, okay whether it's researching a thing or whether it's kind of um like you know dealing with improving access to a place uh, which are all great great endeavors undoubtedly but i think that to my knowledge, there's not really any place that gives that gives grants to like competition related uh, research sure. or data gathering and that or that sort of thing. Um, but it would be it would be great if there was. I don't know where you know I don't know who would I don't know where that would come from. But um, the money but will yeah. come if we stay yeah. if we stay around long enough. The money will come. <laughs> yes. Hopefully. 
Anyway, let's call it there. It was uh, it was actually, you know, for, for having been asleep through half of the competition, I'm glad we had a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, next week is Wu Jiang. It is, is it a speed and bouldering? I think it's both again, right? It's just speed and bouldering, and I'll have you uh, make a prediction here. Do you think God that, damn it. Uh, do you think <sighs> Healing Song will break the seven second barrier in Wu Jiang? So, got, you, so to recap, she got 7.101, so she'd have to break her own world record. But 7.1, she's awfully close to that 6.9, you know. Uh, you think so it'll you're, you're asking if I think it's going to happen at the next event? I feel like I'm going to take... I'm going to take the safe money bet and say no, because I think that would be very unlikely. Well, it's if it's going to happen so I'll this bet season... So I'll bet you five of my Canadian dollars, which is okay. like five of your American cents, <laughs> you think, that well, she he, will not. It's, I mean, it's in China, you know? So it's like, if there's any comp <laughs> it's likely that she will do it, just because yeah, of jet maybe. lag and all that other sure. stuff, you know, um, this is, you know, this is, you would think this she has a good chance of doing it here if it's going to happen this season. Um so I don't know. Just for fun, I'll say yes. You say no, I'll say yes. I think she'll break it. I think I'm, she'll 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 break her own world record. I think she's gonna ride that momentum. If not, you can have five American dollars. I'll, I'm gonna know. just to just to continue with my argument. My bet will be that she falls or has a foot slip and doesn't Ooh. make it through the round That'd of be a, sixteen. That'd be a disappointment. Well, we're we're That'd both be. like we're both making very bad uh, bad arguments, but whatever. We'll see what happens. So we'll be back uh, next. Monday with a wrap up for Wu Jiang, which is speed and bouldering. We'll see if Yanya can make it five in a row or four in a row this season. We'll see if we can have a new guy at the top of the podium. If you have any questions or comments, leave it down in the chat. Follow us, you know, wherever we've put, we've plastered this entire overlay with our social media. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I just really emphasize in the comment thing. We like hearing what people think. And this is really a project that John and I are, are really focused on trying to make this a good quality product rather than getting tons of views. So we appreciate those people that are watching if you want to get involved in the conversation we'd love to hear from you with any uh any uh, comments or criticism other than that thanks for watching the debrief we'll see you guys next week